We are live. Got it. Hello. I feel like we didn't get to chat today. There's more beauty in you than anyone. I remember the walk the walks and the side of you. More to your heel, let the waves come and rush in. She took the worry from your head, but then again, she put trouble in your heart instead. Then you fall down to the ground, down to the ground. There's more beauty in you than anyone. I remember who walked the walks and beside you. More to your heel, let the waves come and rush in. She took the worry from your head, but then again, she put trouble in your heart instead. Then you fall down to the ground, down to the ground. All right. Great. Oh, wow. We got to get started. We have we have so many people joining us now. That's great. Um, welcome to Museum of uh, Museum of the African Diaspora's monthly docent led program art as we see it. My name is Sade Gabreyes and I'm with my colleagues and friends, Dimitri, Lucarisa, Charlie, Rodney and Maya today. Um, if this is your first time joining us, Art As We See It is the is a program where we get to we get together and talk uh, about art and music and really whatever comes to mind. We invite you to contribute to our discussion as we look at art with curiosity and wonder. Um, if you're joining us on Facebook, put your thoughts and comments in the chat, and we will jump in and out of Zoom um, to check on you. Uh, we will spend around one hour together discussing folk art and music today. Our stories that are sometimes neatly packaged and other times loosely rendered, uh, but always, always putting people in relationships at the heart. Um, the early tradition of work songs and call and response of the field are sometimes decorated with banjo and the guitar and other times um, just purely vocal. And folk art reflects cultural and spiritual life of a community or communities. We have selected a few pieces that embody those qualities in, and we celebrate the artists and uh, that have created them with you. Yes, Charlie, thank you for putting the name of the artist for our opening music in the chat. Folks are interested to know, thank you. And Pam, great to see you. Thanks for joining us today. Our first piece is this one um, and Dimitri and and um, Charlie will lead us in discussion right after we listen to the music. I was a pretty young girl once. I had dreams, I had high hopes. Married a man who stole my heart away. Gave his love, but what a high price I pay And all that you have is your soul Don't be tempted by the shiny So I, you know, I, I chose this song by Tracy Chapman for, for this piece. Um, because it's just, it, talk, it talks about a per personal moment, personal revolution. And also as we learn about the art, um, we will kind of hear uh, those kind of uh, things come up. And also, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's kind of endearing that Tracy Chapman learned how to play the guitar or learn in her start of music was, it was with ukulele, uh, which is, I, you know, some would say is a, a, folk, um, a folk instrument as well. And so it, it's, um, it's a nice way to start. Uh, Dimitri and Charlie, yeah, take it away for the art. Go ahead, uh, start us off. Yeah, I, I just, I just want to say, I think um, when you're talking about folk art, um, and today told me to say this, so I'll say this, I'm, I'm not the biggest folk art fan, 
um, in the world. There are folk artists that, that I love. Um, Charlie is a much more of a folk artist lover than I am. But one of the things that I, I think is a great entry point into folk art is really learning the story of the maker. I think oftentimes that is what fascinates me and adds layers of uh, complexity and interest to the works for me. So this, I'm, I'm, I'll talk about the artist, I guess. Um, and Charlie, you can talk about the artwork if that if that is a good division of the labor. Um, so this this piece is by Inez uh, Nathaniel Walker, uh, and she is an incredibly fascinating personality. Um, I'll start off with a quote from her. I just draw my own mission, you know. I just sit down and start to draw. Um, and so I think, you know, that, she is prolific. Uh, she was born into poverty um, in South Carolina in 1911, um, and she was also orphaned at a very early age. Married when she was only 16 years old and then quickly had four children. So during the Great Migration, um, she decided to move north, or I guess that's also north and west to Philadelphia to get away from all of the grueling farm work that she had to do in South Carolina. Fast forward, you know, um, to the 1960s, she gets convicted of criminally negligent homicide. So there was a, a man that was abusive to her um, and she ended up killing him and ended up going to prison for this. I mean, there's, there's, so, there's so many stories around, around this right now. It's, you know, very relevant now of, of women being abused and then finally having enough. Um, but unfortunately she, she served in prison. While she's in prison, she just takes to drawing. She start, takes to drawing on anything she can get her hands on. If she can find pencils, if she can find crayons, whatever material. So her earliest work was really made on the back of bills of sale, um, envelopes, whatever she could get her hands on. And there was a counselor that she was seeing within the prison. And one day she just decides to leave this stack of 70 drawings <laughs> on the counselor's chair. So the counselor, you know, finds them and there, there's another woman connected with the prison who, you know, has connections with art galleries and they both collectively decide to buy this artwork. And Inez Nathaniel Walker suddenly has this career where, where she's selling. And so as this happens, um, they start to supply her with um, professional art materials. And so I, you know, I, I just think that's a really interesting way to start off is really knowing her story. Oftentimes her work is auto autobiographical. And the only thing that I will say about this work is that she is really well known for always having these eyes that are simultaneously looking away from us while also looking directly at us. So if you look at those eyes, they're, they're, they're they don't appear to be looking at you when you when because the figures are in profile, but those eyes are directly looking at you the whole time. Um, and Charlie, I'll I'll let you take it away. Yeah, I as as uh, <clears throat> Dimitri said, I I actually am a big fan of folk art, and I think that one of the themes that that really runs through this program that we're going to do today is is that almost all the artists that we that we talked about have have really grown up you know, without the silver spoon in their mouth, which is to say they didn't have the money to buy materials. Um, and we've seen that in a number of the artists that we portrayed. So a lot of these artists really use what's available to them. You know, in this particular case, we have a woman who's in prison. She's not gonna have a lot of materials. She grabs what she can to try to create her art. And there's some things that, that are, <clears throat> excuse me, a little, uh, really charming about this particular piece from my point of view. I, you know, at first glance, it's it's very simple, and you you, know, you could be mistaken into thinking that you know a child might have done this, but it actually has more complexity to it and more interesting aspects to it. And one of the things that I really like is the is the variety of uh, textures that she gets. One of the things she's really well known for in her work is, in particular, the texture of the hair. And if you look at the two women that are shown here, and you can really see how she's thank you, you you can see how she's change the texture in each of the hair styles. So you know you're looking at two different women, even though they, they appear to be very much similar. She's also changed the, the facial tones um, uh, of the two participants in this particular drawing. But one of the things I really want to have you point out is I want you to look at how 
the woman on the right is actually up on a step. So there's a little bit of a difference in between the two heights. And I think that that's, that's just really lovely. It's, a, it's, it's just a nice, subtle touch that, that I really like. And I like her use of different colors and different crayons. You know, if any, even has, anyone has ever taken a, a beginning drawing class, you know, one of the exercises that a teacher might have you do is to try to create different textures with the type of, of strokes that you're doing with a pen, with a pencil, whatever medium that you're, you're doing. And you can really identify in this work a lot of different textures that she's trying to create. You know, look at the sleeves compared to the dress, compared to the pants, compared to the hair. You know, she's really combining a lot of different textures. And of course, she's got these, these really weirdly small hands. I don't know what to make of that. You know, uh, I can only think of the skit that they used to do on Saturday Night Live when I see this, you know, but, um, you know, I, I just, uh, folk art for me, you know, just has this charm. Uh, it has this uh, kind of just basic humanity to it that, that I really like, which is, you know, uh, and others may not like that. And I'm, I'm okay with that. You know, you, you find what you like and, and go with it. But I really love this piece for that. I think I, I just kind of want to also add that, you know, going back into the story, um, she, she says that when she was in prison, she would paint all the bad girls. And Lucurisa Lu, Lu had, has, a, has a thing with this because oftentimes, like if you go back and look at their hands, also as Charlie pointed out, they're likely holding glasses. Those little, those little things in their hands are actually probably glasses because she says all the bad girls are constantly drinking and smoking, um, <laughs> which as Lucurisa put it out, like, wait, they're in prison. How are they drinking? Um, but, you know, these are also part of the narratives that, that, that she tells, which is just, mm -hmm. I don't know, also adds a level of charm to, to her character and to also to her artwork. Lucarista, were you one of the bad girls or? Uh... <laughs> there we go. <laughs> All right. Well, it's really, really I, before I, shade, I know. This, this innocence, this innocence here. <laughs> Perfectly. <laughs> but, you know, thank you so much. I, I, I think, you know, I, I like this piece, but I never saw it the way that you um, kind of led our eyes to see this. So I appreciate that. Um, all right, our next one is, I think, just as interesting. Thank you for that, Charlie and Dimitri. Will you harbor a Haitian glory in your check, a lesbian or a gay? Will you harbor a Christian, a Muslim, a Jew, a so you know Lucarisa chose this song and after reading the the lyrics and I wish I could I could put the lyrics in the chat and um, I, I have a copy somewhere and I'll put it in the chat and it's by Sweet Honey in Rock um, it's an old woman African-American uh, acapella group uh, and uh, they're award-winning group that that go into historical folk music and also uh, new the, into making new folk music as well. And so it's a it's a really good uh, yeah it's a really good song. And if I can find the lyrics, I will also put uh, put that in the chat for you. Um, and I think we have Lucrisa and Dimitri for this one. Lucrisa, I'm gonna let you start this one off. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so this piece is just very, it's very intriguing to me. It's raw and it's provocative. Um, it's, it leads me to reimagine the Statue of Liberty. And, you know, when I heard the song and you know, thought of this piece, it, you know, there's questions there, you know, it's like, if, if this were, you know, the Statue of Liberty, the real Statue of Liberty, you know, how would people feel about that? It just, it just fosters questions. And just the, the rawness of how he created the piece, 
Um, you know, he he uses really unusual uh, methods of, of creating his paintings. He, number one, very rarely uses brushes. He uses his hands and his fingers. And then he uses um, a combination of sugar and uh, whatever he has kind of lying around the yard. I mean, he uses collard greens and beet juice and things to create his masterpieces. And then um, the paintings are always based on um, people or, uh, or buildings that he has actually seen. And so, you know, his, his creation of this piece came from him visiting um, when he was doing an exhibition uh, in New York. And, and so then that also fosters questions because if he's creating pieces based on what he sees and he saw the Statue of, Statue of Liberty and this is what he came up with, I got all kinds of questions about this. I mean, it's just absolutely intriguing. Um, I know that um, he started out uh, painting as, as a child and, but he actually set aside his, his, um, his craft for a while uh, during the time of the depression because he said it didn't produce an income. So he put it aside. Um, so, you know, then he started working, you know, at farms. He started, he worked at the Alabama Power um, uh, Company, but then he had to come back to painting in the, uh, in the 60s. And interesting enough, when he first started out painting, he was basically painting on wood. But when he came back to uh, painting, he didn't uh, so much use wood, he used pieces of iron. And he didn't just use mud, but he actually would go to railroad tracks and get the rust off the side of the, of the tracks. And he would have to sneak in there because you know he thought people would try and, and hurt him because they thought he was trying to steal something. But he would use things like that. And he, he said, and where he lived, there was all kinds kinds of color um, in the ground and in the dirt and in the mud. And so he said he got at least 23 colors of dirt from his own yard that he would use to paint as well. And he would just mash coffee grounds and walnut hulls together, um, berries, you know, blackberries, pokeberries, and he'd smash them together with a, a stick and then he'd use, use his hand and start to paint. And I also think it's really interesting that if he's using his hands and his fingers to paint the definition in this painting, how is he getting that with just his fingers? But he said he he never wanted to use store bought uh, store bought um, art supplies. He said, "My hands are my brushes. When the brushes die, I die." And so <laughs> that was just kind of his his um, his thought process on that. Um, I also found it really interesting that um, he was asked at one point to use blood as, as uh, coloring, and he drew the line at that. It's like, okay, I'm going to use dirt, and I can use berries, I can use collard greens, uh, you know, I can use beets, but we will not be using blood, <laughs> which I thought was very interesting. Go ahead, uh, Dimitri. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't, I don't have very much to add. I think, I think Luke Carissa, you captured it all. But again, he's, he's someone who, I, his story is just extremely fascinating. Um, you know, growing up in Alabama, his mother was a root woman. She, she was a medicine woman. He said that she would go out into the forest for hours searching for his words, weeds, that she would turn into medicine, you know, just wild, wild um, herbs and flowers and roots. Um, and so he would just entertain himself by playing. And one of the stories that he tells, you know, is that he would, he would draw things using mud and minerals and, you know, the rainstorm would come and they wouldn't be there. Well, he, he recounts the story where one day, not quite sure how it happens. He says he's, he's in this mud hole that he would climb into to paint things. And some guy comes along and dropped syrup into the mud. Uh, so I don't, I'm assuming maple syrup, but I don't know if maple syrup grows in Alabama, right? It's like a, associated with the, so I don't know what kind it is. Um, and, and then he notices that the, the sweetness, the sugar um, of whatever syrup this is actually makes it stick. So a rainstorm comes, I think he's only nine when this happens. Um, and the, the painting is still there. So his mother encouraged him and so I think, you know, for him, the art making was this very spiritual, um, 
you know, lots of the folk artists are, are inspired by a Christian spirituality. Um, but for him, it was a very earthy, in touch with nature um, form of spiritual spirituality that, that, that I think, you know, he embodied through the painting and why he, yeah, like uh, Maya says, this is why he drew the line at painting with blood. Like that's taking it too far. You know, one of the things that um, he also talked about was that, you know, during his his time growing up, um, that, you know, he had to develop strategies for survival. And so in particular, that was, you know, survival with um, with Caucasian people, because, you know, at that time, um, you had all kinds of things happening. You walked upon people, the bodies swinging and all of that. And so he said, you know, he said, you 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 don't um, get caught thinking. And so the artist became a minstrel. He said, trickster as minstrel, minstrel as trickster. In every self-portrait there, there's, and there's too many to count, we see the minstrel of this trickster, casually grinning, gaping, jiving, playing his guitar on, or his harmonica, entertaining, revealing what he wants us to know and concealing the rest. Oh, yeah. wow. I just I just want to add a couple more things with with him because again he's super fascinating. But his very first public exhibition was um, at the Fayette Art Museum, and then just a few years later, his work was included in um, the Smithsonian uh, American Folk Life uh, exhibition. So you know just just interesting. He also I think uh, was invited um, for an interview on the Today Show, which. Is probably around the same time when he's visiting New York and seeing the Statue of Liberty for the first time. Um, I, I just I, I I love his story. I love yes. the arc of his career. Agreed. Yes. <laughs> oh wow! Thank you so much, Lucrisa and Dimitri. I I did not know a lot of what you just shared with us. And that, did so that was his first time seeing the Statue of Liberty. So this was from imagination. Yes. This, oh, this, wow. Yeah, this so, yeah. And okay. I, I just wanted to add just one other thing because this is yeah. just so fascinates me. So we talked about, you know, um, the, the hair or the crown. And it's just fascinating to me that, you know, it's both the crown that he saw on the Statue of Liberty, but they also resemble Bantu knots, which at that time we would That's what I saw. Yeah, would not have had a concept of that, but yet there it is, you know? Oh, wow. Yeah. Oof. All right, this, this one. Well, the river bank makes a mighty good road. Dead trees will show you the way. Left foot, back foot, traveling on. Follow the drinking gourd. Follow the drinking gourd. Follow the drinking gourd. The... I think with this song, the lyrics, if you could just look at the the uh, you know, the candle holder that the, the person is holding, um, it kind of makes sense that Charlie uh, put those two together and also um, that the, the person holding the light and it's, uh, it's a, this song is Follow the Drinking Gourd is African-American folk song um, from 1920s and 1928 is when it was published. But the story comes, uh, goes way back uh, before that as well. And it is, um, it's it's pointing to the Big Dipper in the night skies. The, the, so the to follow the Big Dipper as it points to the north, and it's uh, it's one of um, the songs where uh, enslaved folks had communicated by which which way um, to go, which way which path to follow as they follow the under underground um, uh, railroad, and so it was called um, it, it it was first um, sang by Peg Leg, uh, Peg Leg Joe um, in, to guide some, some enslaved folks. And so this, this song I thought was really a, a, good, a good fitting song for this piece. Yeah. And I wanna invite Lucrisa uh, and Rami for this piece. Um, I can go first if you want. Um, 
first, I, I think it's a very fitting piece for us to be discussing during Black History Month. The artist, uh, Dr. Charles Smith, is very focused on, on understanding Black history and making sure we, um, you know, think about the, the um, you know, the incredible impact that racism has had on all of us, uh, on Black people in particular. And him, in his life, his father was the victim, was murdered in a hate crime, which kind of brings to mind events today, the, uh, the, the trial finding, finding, uh, you know, that, that with their, you know, it is, um, you know, this is still with us. Um, and then he served in Vietnam and um, was uh, affected by Agent Orange and has PTSD. And, and art was really a, something he did to, um, you know, kind of cope with, with that past. Uh, so this piece of, of uh, someone leading people in the Underground Railroad, he um, mentions Glenette Tilly Turner, and then there's a statement from the artist. Uh, Mother Glenette Turner is a community historian who shares information about the African Americans of Aurora, Illinois. She helps keep the legacies of the ancestors intact, respected, and understood. This Underground Railroad series is the most requested among my works. So, you know, he really wants to, you know, this is, you know, a lamp, and it's someone who's uh, bringing some, some people out of slavery, but it's also um, maybe making mention to people like um, Mother Turner, who is is um, bring, shedding light on important aspects of Black history. Lucresa. Yes. Now, this gentleman has the story. <laughs> oh, my God, his life was amazing. Um, you know, as as Rodney said, you know, he was he was in um, in the service and he said that his experiences in combat uh, left a deep physical and psychological and spiritual wound and lasting memories of brutality, pain and suffering and loss. Um, and so when he got out of the service, um, you know, he had several jobs, he got married, but his life just spiraled downward and he became a drug addict. He said, I was lost and I was confused and I was full of hate from the racist attitudes that drove me to this point. He said, but then God gave him what he needed. And, you know, I kind of find that happens a lot in um, the stories of, of folk artists that, you know, that they are led by uh, God giving them this vision or God, you know, speaking to them. But he said um, he heard the voice of God and God had one word for him, art. So he had just lost his job as a rehab counselor and still dealing with the anger. And he said, when God said, art, use art, I'm giving you a weapon. He said, it was just like God gave Dr. King the Gandhi strategy. And he said, he gave me that, that weapon and I wore it out seven days a week, 24 hours a day, non-sleeping, non-eating, I just made art. And so he was able to buy uh, this derelict house and lot um, in Ohio, I think it was. And he said he had never tried his hand at art before. He had no training, but what he did was he collected pieces of wood and he began to transform them into historical persons, faces and bodies that came to him in visions. And he would just carve and paint the, the figures and put them out in the house, um, out, outside of the house in the yard. And um, he would allow them to what he called weatherize when he put them outside. And then that's kind of when they, the art pieces, made their, their selves known or made, them, made, made themselves present. Um, he said that he created, he created um, just a historical representation of um, African-Americans starting from the time of slavery up until now. And he said, um, he had, he created things like, um, um, I think, it was, oh, runaways, prisoners, martyrs, slaves, uh, plantation slaves. And then he would also create, you know, the leaders. He said Harriet Tubman, Martin Luther King, Michael Jordan. You know, there's a memorial to um, 
Eric Morris, who was a five-year-old that was thrown to his death from the 14th floor um, of Ida Bill B. Wells housing project. He just did all of these things because of these visions and because God told him to use art um, as, a, as, as his weapon. And so I just, I just thought it was so amazing, so amazing, his, his life story. Um, Lucrecia, I wanted to ask your thoughts on, um, you know, some aspects of this, this work, uh, particularly the feet. So what do you think is going on with these, these two um, unusual looking feet? Well, you know, in actuality, you know, we, we all had this discussion and we were trying to figure out, you know, what the, was the symbolism behind it. In actuality, it was just what he had on hand. He didn't have any specific reasons for, for using the different pieces that, um, the different things that he, he used in his art. It was what he had at hand and what worked for the piece at the time. It, it, to me, it's a very haunting um, kind of image. And, yes. Uh, you know, it brings to mind, um, you know, the Barry Jenkins Underground Railroad uh, series uh, that was recently, I guess it's still available on Amazon. And just uh, the, that is so hard hitting and, and just makes you realize how harrowing the Underground Railroad really was. Yes. You know, he, um, he had 600 sculptures and 150 fixed monuments in his front yard. And uh, 2000, he worked with the Smith Kohler Foundation, and they removed 448 sculptures from the, from the site, and they were conserved and gifted to mis, um, to museums around the country. And he still has, you know, over he still has, I think they said over 200 in his front yard, and he, you know, just con continued to do this. So it it oh, really wow. a calling and a vision for him. You're very prolific. Yeah. Oof. Thank you, Ronin Lucrisa. That was really interesting. And I think, uh, you know, um, Charlie, awesome job with the music as well. I think it went really, really well together. Yeah. He was born when in was 1940, born? Jerry. Uh, okay. Yeah, he's still alive. He's 81 years old. Okay. Right. Shall not, we shall not be moved like a tree that's planted by the water. We shall not be moved. We shall not, we shall not be moved. We. So I. You know, the, with, with this piece, We Shall Not Be Moved, I think all, uh, many of us know the song from, um, from church. And um, Mavis Staples is a gospel blues singer um, that beautifully sings the song that is, um, that's encouraging and also grounding. Um, and I, I, you know, I, I thought this was such a good, um, a good song for this piece. Yeah, and I think we have, we have Ronnie and Charlie. Yeah, I, I, I again, I love folk art. I, I love this particular piece. I think it's really wonderful. So Minnie Evans is, uh, was from North Carolina. And when she was a, a young woman, she was, I think she's 17, she started working as the gatekeeper uh, for this preserve uh, on the estate where she was living called Early on Sound. And here there was this actual tree, which was over 400 years old. And so she's another person where the link between religion and art is really, really strong. She had this sort of vision that God said to her, you know, why don't you draw or die? And so she had this sense of duality about what she had to do. So she took the advice of this vision and really uh, talks a lot about visions in her in her work. A lot of times she says she doesn't she doesn't plan these things out. She just 
draws them or paints them and creates them. And then later on is as surprised as anyone else when, when she's seeing them. She feels like she gets into almost like a hypnotic state when she's doing this. But I, I just love this work. One of the things that, that I think you can guess when you look at this is it has a great deal of impasto. And impasto is this artistic term for the layering on of lots and lots of paint. So if you were, you know, let's say they would let you do this. If you were able to rub your hands over this painting, you'd be able to feel all these crags and crannies of this particular tree. And I love, you know, here's this 20 foot, you know, the base of the tree, 20 feet wide. And, and you really get the sense of, stability and solidity and importance of this tree. And I, and I love this inclusion of this, this little bench, this little white bench in front of it, where you, you really get the sense that, you know, that this is a place that she probably sat often and thought about this solidity, this connection to the earth, this connection to her past, if you will. But I think the other interesting thing to, to think about just from a artistic perspective is just how cramped this canvas is. If you think about it, you don't even see the tops of the trees. You don't even see the full width of the branches. And, and so she's really having this concentrate on the thickness of this tree and what that means, the weight of it, the heaviness of it, the permanence of it. Rodney, did you have some thoughts about this piece? You know, I, I do think it's really interesting the way she um, she crops it inside the frame. It's it's such a powerful tree. And then, you, you know, the other thought, you know, it's 400 years old. It's a tree that actually predates uh, slavery. You know, it's been, it, it was here before, and it's kind of been here throughout this whole um, long history. And then, of course, I think it does evoke um, being a powerful Black person, Maybe for me, it seems like a woman, and um, you know, it's kind of like a like seems like like a monument or something or a, or a protective force. You know, I, I get I get all those things from it, and I just think it's really interesting that it kind of, it is an actual tree, and um, you can actually see photographs of this tree because it's still still around. She did this. She was already in her sixties when she did this work. Uh, and um, she lived to, to she lived to be pretty um, pretty old. I think she lived to be almost ninety. So um, yeah, no, I, I like you, Charlie. Was really taken by this work. And it's interesting because she really worked at this estate as this gatekeeper her entire life. You know, she started as a seventeen year old girl and then retired from there. So you can only imagine what her relationship was to this magnificent tree and how important it was for her. You, know, you can you, you just get that sense when you look at this painting. It's not like, you know, I think I will create a painting of a tree. You really get a sense that this relationship goes much, much deeper for her. And, and I think we can appreciate that in this work. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's one I would really love to see um, in person. I believe it's um, hanging in Washington, DC. So just- I hope it's got a big heavy hook. Yes. This yes. painting probably weighs a lot. You know, she just did all, all layers and layers and layers of, you know, with sort of getting paint soft with turpentine and then adding on to it and adding on to it, you know, kind of like uh, sort of Jay DeFeo did with the rose, you know. So I would imagine that this is a, uh, a very heavy work. You know? It's almost a sculpture. Yeah. I hope I'm not the only one that sees fire. Mm. where the flowers I mean I, I you know I can I can switch my eyes to see flowers but I, for, for some reason I can't help but see fire um all around the tree so yeah is Jennifer that, is, that from, is that a very California way of looking at it today <laughs> The last two hey, years. What what you're reading of that? If you think uh, <laughs> if you think of fire in that, what, what what do you think she's trying to say? If that's true, well, yeah. I I mean, I don't know. I, I haven't really thought about it um, deeply, but I I think I saw it through the song that uh, that uh, we we paired with this. I I see it through the music, um, so it kind of gives me resilience of this tree, but. Um, despite all of the fire around it. But that's me making up a, a lot of stories uh, for well, this tree. Well, so Jennifer, I, Jennifer, I really says, you know, Jennifer says growth, movement, fire in the belly. Mm. 
Yeah. No, I think that that's what's so great about, uh, you know, really good art is that you do make stories up, you know, and it's not necessarily one story that we all come away with different stories. You know, that's the, that it, you know, it doesn't have to be a visual art, you know, think about right. music, think about, you know, books or, or, you know, plays that you see, you know, it, it's always wonderful when you can get all these different perspectives that are getting drawn out, you know, and sometimes the artist is doing it deliberately. Sometimes it just happens that, 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 that's what works so well in a work of art. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Yeah, that is true. And, and Jennifer continues to, it's the season. She definitely movement, even children playing. So I, I, now I'm starting to see children play. Okay, so yeah, then first coming with Roddy and I to Washington D.C. to go see, and yeah. while the guard's not looking, see if we can touch this painting. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, I think I don't know if we're ready for this next one. I'm not even going to talk about the music uh, because it's everything, and you'll know what I mean. Lord, I'm running, running for the city. I got the new world in my view. Come on, get an army. Help me to run this holy righteous way. Can't you hear them? Savior calling. Well, he's knocking at your door today. I got that new world in my view. Lord, my journey I pursue. I said I'm running. Okay, Dimitri and Lucurisa, I'm just, I'm not even going to talk about the music because how can we separate it from the art? So yeah, please take it, take it away. Lucurisa, I don't know how, which order you want to go. We can just go back and forth if you like, but I love, and I'm totally obsessed with Sister Gertrude Morgan in so many ways. Um, I'll just, I'll just say just quickly before even going into her life and her story, I first became this true story became uh, introduced to her music through the HBO series, True Blood, The Vampire Show. Um, the musician King Britt remixed her music because it's amazing into a dance mix and it made it onto one of the episodes of True Blood. And I'm like, who is this? And so the more that I started digging into her, so he released this album in 2005 um, and a resurgence of interest in Sister Gertrude Morgan came up in 2005 because a huge event happened in her home city where the city that she met her home, New Orleans, um, flooded because of Hurricane Katrina. Her house was a neighborhood um, uh, monument, basically. Um, and there was, there was a process of gutting the house and restoring it and Hurricane Katrina wiped the house out. Um, and so then this resurgence of interest around her and her life story came up. This woman, Lucuris, I don't know if you wanna, I, I don't wanna take any of your no, thunder from this. No, 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 go for it, Dimitri. <laughs> <laughs> but she would, I'll, I'll keep it, I'll keep it quick, but you know, she's, she was born in Alabama around 1900 um, and eventually moves to, you know, she's one of these people that Christ spoke to her as a teenager. Um, and she caught the Holy Spirit and, you know, heard actually God speaking to her, telling her that she needs to uh, preach the good word. Um, and she eventually, she gets married. She eventually, you know, in, in Alabama, leaves her earthly husband, as she calls him, um, to move to New Orleans. Um, in New Orleans, she ends up meeting these other two women, another sister and another mother. And I do not remember their name. <laughs> and they 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 start um, out of one of the women's homes. They start an orphanage um, where they start dressing themselves completely in black, and you know they feed children. Um, you know, not just orphan children, but children that have illnesses or children that are just not cared for. Um, eventually, she ends up. She she finds herself in all these places where she meets people, they love her, they take her in, and then they let her use their house. Um, so she finds another woman and she starts her own practice. Now, the interesting thing about Sister Mor uh, Gertrude Morgan is that she uses song, she uses her preaching, she uses her art, everything is to preach the gospel. Um, and she's particularly interested in the book of Revelations. And she says, you know, there's so much imagery, the four horsemen, um, you know, the 
the uh what's her name the, like the jezebel of babylon and the the seventh seal like all of these interesting visual cues really make their way um into her work um I'll, I'll say one of the things is like her art becomes huge in 1960 it's really picked up um by the art dealer uh larry borenstein who has a gallery in new orleans and then catches the attention of Lee Friedlander and this guy that you probably have heard of, um, Andy Warhol, who are avid collectors of her work and really propel her career to have these museum exhibitions. Um, so in the 1970s, I mean, she's having major exhibitions um, and the American Folk Art Museum, um, just all over. And then shortly after this explosion of her art career, she stops painting entirely because that's detracting from her work, which is the oh, gospel. Yes. So she entirely stops painting, focuses on music because that's another way to um, spread the good news. Um, just, just a fascinating person all around. And I didn't even talk about the piece we have here. So Laquitisa, I'll let you talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, I'm, I'm like you, Dimitri, I'm just totally caught up and fascinated by the story. So um, just to kind of add to that, one of the things that I thought was really interesting was that in 1965, she had a vision of the Holy Ghost that revealed that she was the chosen bride of God. And after that, she wore only white to symbolize her spiritual marriage. She wore a Chris uh, nurse's uniform, nurse's Oxford, white stockings and a small cap perched on her, her head. So um, I just thought that was really interesting. She also was one of those who worked with any material that was at hand when the spirit moved her. She used cardboard and uh, window shades, styrofoam trays, plastic utensils, jelly glasses, wood, lampshades, picture frames, um, her guitar case, um, she even uh, at one time used a, uh, the back of a for sale sign that was placed in her yard by her real estate agent. So, which I just thought, wow, she just, she really, when she had to, had to paint, she had to paint. Um, she used the different, um, uh, she used acrylics and poster paint and watercolors and wax crayons and ballpoint pen all together in the same piece. You know, it, it, it didn't matter to her. She just, if she had a vision, she had to get it out. Um, she would use her calligraphy to convey important messages from the word of God, Bible, um, and specific scriptures. Um, you know, she painted a lot of portrait of self portraits um, of which one of them is on the right hand side. And when I looked at this, you know, the first thing I thought, because I have a Baptist background and the first thing that I thought I remembered as a child being in really small churches that, you know, didn't have air conditioning. And so people would would literally they would faint. And so you always had on the back seat of the church a nurse or two to assist, you know, with these people who had fallen out, they would call, come with, with smelling salts or, you know, put um, uh, sheets over them or, you know, fan them. So that's what I thought when I, I first saw this, I just thought, okay, that's just kind of par for the course for these little Baptist churches, you know? And um, so, you know, she would create these fans and they would, you know, have uh, pictures on both sides of them. And, um, Let's see. Yes, Carol. Yes, definitely. Holy Ghost and the fans. That's exactly it. And so I also I think on this picture, she was also just portraying um, her her marriage to uh, to to Christ. And she used the words God and Christ interchangeably and the heavenly host. Um, on, on the left side, I, I, I had thought that this was, you know, just somebody's people singing in the choir, but apparently it is a, de a depiction of uh, what she saw as the heavenly host. Um, so just she's just a fascinating person, very interesting um, ways of using um, different products for presenting her her works of art and you know also the the music going with this called the, the i think it's the new jerusalem of course referring to as uh, demetrius said to revelations and um she talked about um uh, a lot about christ just preparing for his marriage to her um the, the wedding ceremony 
And um, <clears throat> she talked also about just kind of uh, resting and relaxing and kicking back with, with Jesus, which I just thought was <laughs> amazing, just totally amazing. She had these rooms that were all white. Um, they were prayer rooms and she would hand out these particular, these types of fans to people when they entered into uh, these, these prayer rooms where she would preach and she'd sing prayer songs. And um, she passed away uh, in her sleep and didn't leave any, any known survivors. So just a very interesting life, a very artistic life, but she always made sure that everyone knew this was the work of God and that her job was to preach the gospel. It wasn't about the art. It was, it was all about God. I knew, I knew this was going to be such, yeah, I, you know, it's just, um, this is the first time that we've had someone that does the art in the music all in one and had Dimitri not, not uh, told me about the music I wouldn't have never known I've only I would have only seen her as a painter so I think the music just rounds everything up and I, I really appreciate that and if 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 you know I, I will ask folks to go on YouTube and check out her music some of them remixed but the original ones are just just fantastic all right the next one is this one of course, we can't have, uh, you know, we can't talk about folk art without talking about quilts. So here we go. Oh, Emma, help me to pull these weeds. Oh, Emma, oh, mm -hmm. you turn around, dig a hole in the ground. Oh, Emma, oh, Emma, what's harder than two grown men? Oh, You know, just at a glance without learning so much about this painting, um, it, it reminds me of field and, and, and you know, growing things. And this song, oh, um, um, Ho Emma Ho, is, the, is an example of work song or field song. Um, and it, um, it, it's, uh, it's worked, it, it was sang by enslaved folk, the folks on uh, planta plantation farms. And it is, it has a lot of coded, uh, coded information in the lyrics. I mean, at some point, um, if you listen to the whole song, you would hear, um, you know, someone um, refer to as a, a, a possum. And the possum is supposed to be the watcher or um, the watcher or um, I don't the overseer. And um, it, so, and after Emma, they talk about somebody else. And these kind of work, work songs and field songs are supposed to uh, keep pace and also let work, uh, work time pass. Um, and also communicate a lot of coded information within the community. Um, so, you know, the structure of this work and the, the way that it shows um, things that grow from earth and work of the earth, it just remind it just kind of connected uh, um, the song to, to, this, to this work for me. Yeah, and I think Lucrisa and Dimitri, you might have this piece. Yes. Yes. Um, do, do you want me to kind of start this one up also? <laughs> um, I'll, I'll, I'll again, I'll just again. You're ready. My, yeah, again, my focus is on the artists themselves um, and their story. And then Lucurisa can talk about the formal or the story or both. But um, again, that, that's out that this is my interest in the work is the artists and their story themselves. So Clementine Hunter um, was born the daughter of enslaved parents. Um, and she was born onto a plantation, which is believed to have uh, inspired Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe. Um, so that's a really interesting um, little side note about her. Her family moves to Melrose Plantation when she was just a child. Um, and on this plantation, she worked most of her life as a cotton picker. Now, the interesting thing about the Melrose um, Plantation though, it was, is that it was built 
for and by free African Americans at the time. So when she's moving, um, when she's moved to this plantation, she's not enslaved, but she does do manual labor. Um, and she's given this small little cabin, which I guess I will go into, is most likely the one in the bottom left corner of the quilt that we're looking at that becomes her humble house that she makes all of these artworks. She started um, quilting from the late 1950s all the way up until the 1970s, um, and very few of her pieces actually survived. Um, I think that's kind of all that I want to say, but it's but on the quilt, I mean, I guess it's portraying in the center, Melrose House. Um, we can't see it right now, but um, on the top is Africa House, then there's Yucca House, um, and another uh, building down here is most likely the one that she lodged in herself. So, you know, this follows a very African-American tradition of quilt making. It's not, uh, it's, it's diverging from European standards of quilt making. You'll notice I always like to look at how the lines don't, don't line up. Um, often in uh, Southern African-American uh, quilting, which is a tradition, um, you know, that, that they've unfolded with the recent, you know, some all the attention around the G's Bend quilts where the, the lines not matching up actually goes back to West African uh, textile traditions where it keeps evil spirits out. It, it does not let evil spirits lie within um, within the fabric. Now, whether she's working from that or not, and consciously or unconsciously, you know, there, there's still that tradition that that persists. And over to you, Luke, what do you say? I think you pretty much covered it. Um, one of the things that I, I would like to say that I found really interesting is the fact that um, Clementine actually started out as a painter and um, that the uh, Melrose Place was actually um, uh, made into a retreat for visiting artists. And what would happen is when she would go in to clean the place after the artist left, they would leave leftover paints and things. And so she would take that leftover paint and um, make her own paintings. And so um, she she would paint stories that she felt like historians would over were overlooking, and that was primarily the activities of black people and, and black workers. And so that I just thought that was really interesting. And then she was you know known to be um, a, a really good sewer. And then that's kind of how the uh, quilts came into place. And so she would always make these pictorial quilts um, um, as actually kind of secondarily <laughs> to her painting, which I find to be really interesting. Um, so she would just transfer her artistic skills into quilting and kind of go back and forth. Um, she would, you know, use, um, she would make quilts that much uh, like her paintings, just depicting um, African-American life at the time. And so I just found that to be really interesting. I'm also always just fascinated with quilting because number one, I don't sew well. I mean, I'm the type of person if you know, I rip a sock, it's, it's going in the trash or something because I'm not going to sew it. So I'm always <laughs> quite fascinating, fascinated by how people quilt and how they just bring these different, differing, um, uh, textures of, of fabric and, you know, little pieces of fabric and bring them together enough to actually give a portrait of something. I mean, like when I look at this, you know, we were looking at the, the close-up of the actual Melrose Place and I'm like, how in the world, I mean, you're cutting all of these little pieces and you're creating houses. Um, we've discussed whether or not these um, other pieces are actually trees, but I, it's just fascinating to me how they bring all of that together and keeping in mind that I think at the time that she was making this, there wasn't a lot that were, was done by uh, machinery. You know, it was done by, by hand. And, you know, they would have quilting circles and they'd all come together and, and create, you know, um, these things together. And I just thought, I, I just find quilts fascinating, just absolutely fascinating, just for the, the sheer amount of work that it takes to get it done. I agree. I'm, I'm glad that we put in a quilt. We found a quilt and also, you know, such an incredible artist also uh, for this. And thank you, Lucrisa and, and Dimitri for that. Uh, our second to last piece is this one. Well, you guys gave me a hard time about this one. So let's see. Mm -hmm. 
maman m'vrie m'pézé café So listen, we're Museum of the African Diaspora, so we hopped over to Haiti for this one, and it is, um, uh, you know, Perez, um, um, Peze Café is um, a popular folk song, uh, a loose translation of 100 years old Creole hymn from, from Haiti, and a song tells a story of a child who was sent by his mother to go get coffee and to go buy coffee. And uh, on his way back from getting the coffee, you know, bad luck, he gets arrested. I don't know what he did. Um, he gets arrested and then, um, and then he's more concerned about actually delivering the, co the coffee to his mother than actually being arrested and getting in trouble along with that. So this story, this it's a it's it's a sweet and sad song um, at the same time from uh, from Haiti. And so it just kind of reminded me of um, I don't know I I I don't think everyone in our group agreed, but it just reminded the person over here reminded me of just like the boy that was running from the shop back to back to his mother and whatever else happened. So that's why I chose it. So let's let's hear it from Charlie about this piece though. I think Rodney's gonna start first well, this time. I, oh, I you got really, it, okay. I was really intrigued by this image because you know your eye is drawn to the figure in the front. And you know, the question is who is that guy? Um, William Hawkins uh, did this in 1980. He was 85 years old. <clears throat> And uh, actually, he, he was going to he had 10 more years to live. So, um, he, you know, he isn't even at the end of his life. But and then he signing his name. First of all, I loved I loved the prominence of his name uh, in on the work. And then his birth date, that was something he typically did. But, yeah, I go back to this question, like, who is that guy? Is that guy him? Uh, he, he grew up in Kentucky, lived on a farm. He was known for working with just whatever materials he could find. So like plywood, this, is, this thing's on plywood. Um, he would even use like recovered paints and things like that. Um, so a very resourceful artist. Um, <clears throat> but let me ask like Charlie today, like who, who do you think this guy is in the uh, painting? Say you had well, a I favorite. <clears throat> I, I'm not entirely sure. I, I've i heard Sailor and, uh, you know, so many things from our group now. It's it's a little bit, kind of, I feel like it's a, it's a Sailor that's just walking about town. I don't know. Good we, question though, Rashi. We did, we did have the suggestion there was Dimitri. Yeah, <laughs> Bootsy Collins. <laughs> Why not, right? <laughs> Bootsy visits uh, some little town in Kentucky and and then he's got these keys. Like, are, what are those the keys to? Bootsy Collins can play in any key. That's right. <laughs> nice. And then, like, well, what is the mood of this of this painting? Carol says it's the key to the mothership. Could be. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've again, I, I really like folk art, so I find this this real this piece really charming. Uh, you know, he, he, one of the sort of keystones of his work is he does these little borders and he puts a little bit of information, you know, in this particular case, his birthday, but he, but he used to, he, he, he moved uh, from the South to Ohio and he used to carry around this huge sort of archive of photographs, uh, particularly of Columbus, Ohio. And he would do a lot of paintings of some of the buildings of Columbus. You know, Columbus is a, is a, uh, big college town uh, that's where Ohio State is and so he does uh, what was considered a really famous painting of the stadium for uh, Ohio State for so for you Buckeye fans you know you might want to check that out but I think one of the things that's really interesting which you can see on this close-up if you look between those buildings you see the sort of pink and, and brown and uh, kind of greenish area that really seems to evoke plywood which is exactly what this is painted on 
again, we're returning sort of that theme that we started with, the idea that, that these artists are using, really what's available, right? This is, this is not, you know, this collection of Parisian artists who are, you know, finding canvases and, and using that, but it's, uh, you know, they're finding what they can to, to create these works. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's, it's easy for, this, for people to say, you know, this is a really simple work and I don't know, anyone could do it. Well, you know, anyone can't do it. it it's, it's really a question of what your vision is. You know, how are you, how are you showing your life, your town, your history, your, you know, your community. And, and I think that that's what, what makes these pieces so uh, strong for me. You know, I, I just love that, you know, there's the food bar and, you know, you could imagine the pool hall is nearby and maybe the, you know, the, the maybe the town store. Uh, so, I, oh, we have something that says my great grandfather had one of the first black owned businesses there in Columbus. Oh, so wow. there you go. Okay. Uh, so, you know, it's just, I, I Again, these these are things that I find charming. You know, there people are are not telling their stories in these huge or uh, overbearing ways. They're telling their stories in these small, very personal ways, and and that's what I really love about folk art is that you do. You know, it's like that tree. I don't know how many people have seen that tree. Maybe thousands, thousands, tens of thousands, maybe more. I don't know. And yet, you know, here's this woman who decides she needs to show this as part of her personal history. And I think this is the same kind of thing that you see with Hawkins is that, you know, that he is seeing his world. He's creating his world and he's sharing his world and his his worldview with us. And I, and, I, and I think it's really, really nice. And who knew that Bootsy Collins visited Columbus? <laughs> I with a bunch of keys in his hand you know who knew who knew has um i am so glad folks have stayed with us this whole time i appreciate all of you so much um and remember we will send you all of the links so you can check out um these pieces on your own and also listen to the music uh, our last one before we go away i think it's very fitting because it's a train that goes away um there we go Miles from my home. And I hate to hear that lonesome whistle blow. Well, this train I ride on is a hundred coaches long. Hear the whistle blow a hundred miles. If this train run me right, I'll be home on a morrow night. Cause I'm nine hundred miles from my home. Again, here's a, you know, just a great work of, of folk art. You know, I, I have to, you know, think of uh, a Paul Simon song, you know, everyone loves the sound of a train in the distance because everyone knows it's true. I mean, there's something about trains that's very, very alluring to us. And, you know, really right from the start of, of steam trains, you know, if you look at Turner's work, you know, what's one of the first things that he paints? Well, it's not one of the first things he paints, but one of the famous things that he paints is trains because they're, you know, it's the new world and the new, technology, if you will. You know, I think now in 2022, I think a lot of us are actually looking backwards at trains with, with a nostalgia. I, I remember when I was a, a young man, I took the train across Canada and it was just the most thrilling ride of my life. I just loved every aspect of it. So I think that, that all of us have some sort of connection to a train, you know, even if we even if we hear those occasional train whistles or tra they're not train whistles anymore, I guess they're train horns, honks, I don't know what you call them, but you know, I can hear them in San Francisco coming from, coming from Oakland. Uh, you know, if it's just the right sort of texture in the, in the air, I can, I can hear them. So I think there's something about trains that really speak to us. And you know, here, here's another guy who, who uh, you know, again, I gotta repeat this theme. He's working with things that he has on hand. You know, this is a man who is a very simple man. You know, he, he was illiterate uh, for his entire life and he basically, found his escape in art. And what he would do is he was he would pick up whatever was around his farm. And he, and, you know, he really got into woodworking. He, apparently the story is that he, his wife died and, and you know, through his sadness, he really began to create these works out of wood. And, and so all the, everything that you see here is, is, is made out of wood. And some of it is three-dimensional. Again, you could, it's a little hard to tell on the, on the 
the photograph, but the, you know, there's things that are applicate onto the onto the surface of it. So, you know, it just uh, it, 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 to me this this is a universal theme. You know, the the train the train making this big turn in the bend and and I, I really like this piece Rodney yeah for me it really brought to mind another um, important um, period in black history which is the uh, the great migration which much of that was done on trains and it brought to mind the great book uh, the warmth of other sons by uh, Laura mm. Wilkins that I was I, I found just, you know I have to say for me it was very um, eye-opening uh, I learned a lot from that book about about how people left the South, about where people settled. So, like so many of people, so many of the people in the Bay Area came from like Texas and Louisiana. Um, so it was really eye opening. But like also the important role that trains played in all that. And so I, th I would I would think a black audience would would look at trains a little differently. Um, you know, this to me is a very positive vision of a train. Like it, 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 it just kind of warms your heart to see this this really long train um, wending its way through some mountains. Uh, yeah, and it's kind of, he's kind of an interesting artist. I mean, you know, he does these sort of very innocent views of trains and animals and things like that. But he also does a lot of erotica, and a lot of his pieces move. Uh, you know, either with the wind or through a crank. And, you know, apparently there's some sort of pseudo pornographic pieces that he's done. So it's a, you know, just, to, just to give you a different viewpoint on, on the kind of art that he does. But really, he's an interesting artist and uh, worth looking into. Well, there is that last scene in North by Northwest <laughs> of a train going into a tunnel. And I'll, I'll just yeah. leave it at that. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, thank you so much, and I think you've left us, you've left us with um, so much curiosity today about these folks, and also thank you so much. I just want to say thank you for staying with us. Thank you for your comments and and um, feedback in in the chat, um, and I want to say thank you to Dimitri, Charlie, Lucrisa, Rodney, uh, Maya. I just want to say thank you so much. Um, so uh, for this wonderful program, our docents are volunteers who give their time and expertise generously. We meet every week preparing for um, this program. So I really, really appreciate them. And, um, and all of you that joined us today, and to be honest, it's just, uh, it's not fun without you. So show up, come every month. Uh, and with that said, if you would like to continue to support our museum, there are many ways. And to name three, you can, um, if you live in the Bay Area, come and see us. You have until the end of this month for the uh, set of exhibitions that we have. Uh, you can text and donate. You can see the number right here. Any amount is welcome and appreciated and allows us to do these types of uh, free programs. Um, also, you could always become a member of Museum of the African Diaspora and reap the benefits. Thank you again so much, and we'll see you in a month. And next month, you wouldn't want to miss it. We have a big surprise for you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And um, docents, I will see you at our other link. Okay. 